Peter Parker. How do you de-age somebody's face? What's the technique that goes into it? That's just all against blue screen, and it's so effective. The lightning flash is going on is actually hitting him there. That couldn't have been in the original movie. Yeah. Catching the brick. That was like originally not a brick. <laughs> Wait, really? I would say that that secret did not leak. Boom. There, I mean, except for this shot. <laughs> except this for shot this one got frame. out there. Big thanks to Raycon for sponsoring today's episode. Stick around to the end to see how you can get 15% off your purchase of premium everyday earbuds. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artist React. We are joined today by Kelly Port, an amazing artist, a supervisor who's worked on a bunch of amazing films. Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I started 29 years ago with Digital Domain. Strange Days was my first film. Worked on Apollo 13, Fifth Element, Titanic, and most recently been on a Disney Marvel kick with Beauty and the Beast, Maleficent, Avengers, Infinity War, Avengers Endgame, and then most recently with Spider-Man No Way Home as the production side supervisor. Yeah, but have you worked on any like big films? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on my last three films, if you look at gross worldwide box office, their numbers one, two, and three <laughs> are my last three films, which wow. is pretty crazy. So do you get any sleep? I, I don't get any sleep and I don't get any of that box office. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're a visual effects artist. Got yes. it. <laughs> Dude, I remember seeing this shot where they're both flying through the city and it's like, okay, Zendaya's face is obviously real there, but nothing else I imagine is real at all. What was so fun about that, they used something similar in Far From Home, this technique that was just crazy simple. John Watts, I think, came up with it, but it was just this fun sort of doggy cam style where they're kind of on bungee wires and getting pulled by stunt guys, you know, left and right, and, and <laughs> tugged this way, left and right, and he would try to use his arms as he's webbing, and then they would try to kind of do that in sync. And then they had a giant, you know, fan blowing on her, and then her face is just so perfect, like she looks terrified. Yeah. <laughs> but you just, and really, and that's just all against blue screen. And it's so effective and it's so simple too. Some of the challenge comes in is putting that virtual camera through that virtual city because all that stuff behind them, you know, we can't shoot drones. There's restrictions on shooting drones within the city. What's interesting is like trying to find those angles, trying to find the arc of the swing. And so typically the guys would animate a swing and find that arc and then uh -huh. put that virtual camera okay. behind that. Something I'm noticing about the sequence here is the lighting. So if you're swinging through a city like this, the direction of the sun is going to change relative to the angle of this chest-mounted camera. But also, I'm noticing shadows quickly flying over her head there. So was that done on set with, like, flags blocking the light just really quickly and you're having to match that? Or is, is that a digital shadow? It's a little bit of both, but it's primarily in camera. So what you want to do is have a consistent sun angle and then just block it you know okay, to get yeah. that sort of tempo we would do camera tests about like how frequent we thought that would be and this just felt right so if it was too rapid it would look weird mm -hmm. if it wasn't rapid enough it would look weird so it's like finding that goldilocks um sort of rhythm. I do see one thing here, which is like a nightmare for me, which is motion blurred curly hair that's frizzy on a blue or green screen. So how the heck did you do that? <laughs> how did you key your hair to like make it look so clean? It's like all over the place. It's moving, it's frizzy. This one was a little bit harder because the camera was so active and it's one of those screens where you saw a little bit of the back wall, you saw a little bit of things like blocking the lights, and then you saw some painted very dirty blue floor that people oh, yeah. have been walking on. So it makes it even more challenging when you have those kind of things Because now you're having to actually create mats from rotoscoping. One of the tricks that I've learned, what you can do is take alternate takes, even sometimes the same take, where the camera's relatively locked off, where you can really pull a nice good key, and you can take just flying hair. You stabilize that, was, and then you track that onto oh, her wow. own hair. Oh my goodness. So it's wow. her hair being tracked onto her, but it's not her hair at that moment. It's from like some other piece. Wow. I am your hair from the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really clever. So, you know, they have Tom Holland in the actual Spider-Man suit on set, but you end up replacing the suit to make it unify everything together later on. How much of that suit is real versus CG? In this particular case, it's mostly real. Okay. Um, Good looking suit then. It's very perfect, right? Like it's very smooth and you want to see the muscles. You don't want to see stitching or mm. too bad of wrinkles. Yeah. You know? So sometimes that's traditional 2D kinds of cleanup. Sometimes it's easier given the circumstances to just render and light a CG suit in there to help with that cleanup process. Peter, you may have dodged your legal troubles, but things will get much worse. 
with Murdoch here and catching the brick. That was like originally not a brick. <laughs> Wait, really? Yeah. Wait, wow. it was it like was, a hot dog or something? Like It was a snow globe. A snow globe? Yeah, huh. and so that's one of those creative decisions that came after the fact. So that shot where Tom Holland grabs the brick away from Daredevil there. He's actually grabbing a snow globe. So are those CG fingers on his hand? It, you can see it's more of a sphere shape. Yeah, I guess he does kind of like grab like the sides of the brick with his two fingers. It's yeah. <laughs> like, that's a good way to get a <laughs> yeah. <grab> brick. <laughs> and same thing with the Murdoch there at the beginning. Like, so he grabs the brick there and he has it there. So, But you can you tell kinda... kind of by the shape of his palm <laughs> that he's actually grabbing something more spherical. Especially with Tom Holland there with his hands out like in a sphere shape like this as opposed to like brick shape. I had no idea about that. That's fascinating. Yeah. It's one of those things like you don't necessarily pick up on and hopefully not. But I mean, they're Invisible. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. <laughs> and all these invisible effects, the thing that always gets me is that they're not filmed like effect shots. They're filmed like normal shots where you have the extras of the set or the locations locked down. And the fact that the cinematography doesn't change is kind of what keeps those shots being triggered in my mind as visual effect shots. I just see them as normal shots. Yeah. And that's what you want. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. you don't want to be taken out of the movie. That's the worst thing. I mean, this is why I love visual effects just in general is it just, it never gets boring. It's, it's always evolving. The projects are different. The people, the teams, it always keeps it fresh and fun. I always love learning fascinating, interesting things. So leave a comment down below with what you think is the coolest fun fact of a visual effect in a movie, and maybe we'll explain why. Hello, Peter. So there's a lot of talk about de-aging. It's been a thing in visual effects now for like 15, 20 years, I feel like. How do you de-age somebody's face? What's the technique that goes into it? It's a bunch of different techniques. Some studios have sort of a deep fake type of technique. It's a lot of proprietary facial tracking that goes into it. And then they essentially just track that on and have to relight it. But it's also kind of pushing, tucking, and pulling. There's all these sort of characteristics that happen as a human being ages. And those are the things that you just basically have to now correct for and you can overcorrect for it and they start to look too young or too different and so we tried to do our best to keep it pretty subtle but just have it ring more towards what he looked like in that previous film but it really seems like de-aging is a catch-all term for like 10 different actual techniques happening like sometimes it's a straight-up 3d model sometimes you're just doing a little bit of warping to 2d footage mm -hmm. sometimes it's texture work that's like tracked onto the face sometimes it's ai based stuff but it seems like really it's a whole bunch of different techniques all being applied in different ways to achieve ideally the same goal. And it just really depends on the shot that you're doing. Yeah, and I don't think there's really any one technique that's better necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think it's just different approaches to solve the same problem. This was so great when Toby and Andrew and Tom were all there. Cause it was pretty, obviously, as you can imagine, very hush hush. And it was just such a great vibe to have them all there. Definitely the set was a buzz. This is obviously an incredibly major secret. And I would say that for, the, I mean, except for this shot, this shot got out there. Uh, we made a video about it, but like, this was a successfully kept secret. Like no one actually knew for fact that these two were in it, let alone in it as much as they were. What are some of the problems involved with trying to keep such an important secret? It's just thousands of people. Like our visual effects team is by far the biggest team there is. And often the leaks don't necessarily come from visual effects. In this case, I think they did, or an outsourced vendor I think okay. is what, where it really came from. I think the main thing that keeps people from doing it is like, they're just going to lose their job. Yeah. <laughs> like forever. As a studio, when Marvel, Sony sends over a sequence to a visual effects studio to begin work, we call that a turnover. And then when they get that, it's usually sent as a sequence and your name is like watermarked across the whole thing. So it's either the visual effects producer or the name of the studio. And that's <laughs> sort of the preventative medicine, I guess. You're not Peter Parker. One of the final trailers of this movie to drop had like Spider-Man going up against the Sandman, the Lizard, Electro, all in like this climactic shot and then it ends and it's like, oh man, I'm so hyped for the movie. But I guess in, was it Brazil? That shot in that trailer was extended another like 15 frames or so, like a half second. And it was just enough to show the lizard there get hit by a ghost. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously we're seeing these shots that are different from the final thing, but it's not just simply a matter of like, oh, we just turned off the Spider-Man layer. Are these shots created specifically for the trailers? Yes. What, 
What all is involved with having to make that happen? So we literally just remove them from the renders. And if there's shadows, we have to, you know, account for those. So they just remove the, the Andrew and Toby layers. So it kind of maybe is a little bit of just straight up turning off the layer. Yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah. all right. I find it really interesting that there's a lot of visual effects work being done just for the marketing purposes rather than the yeah. final product. Sometimes you also see it's the same shot, like it's a similar shot from the movie, but it's a different take. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. Oh. That happens mm. sometimes, mm -hmm. too. But yeah, sometimes there's a trailer-only shot. It's just additional extra material that's fun to see that you wouldn't necessarily see in the film. Fair point, yeah. It was really cool to just to not only see the three Spider-Man character finally come together, that was very cathartic, but also to have all of these villains from the previous movies come back together. But I also noticed that Lizard and Sandman here are basically in their CG versions the whole time, but we only see small little clips of them as their real people. Did they film anything for this? They did not. We didn't really have access to Resiphons or Thomas Hayden Church, so we actually ended up using footage from the previous films and manipulating it. So Resiphons, when he's healing, we actually used an outtake, and that was shot on film, scanned at high resolution, tracked, body tracked, everything. Like, yeah. So ultimately ended up being a lot of that um, CG, especially for Thomas Hayden Church when he's transforming. We had to manipulate it to get him into the scene, lighting-wise, and all yeah. sorts and things like that. But that you're was, still using the footage as kind of like a base texture, a base, like a, a diffuse texture? Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. Cause I noticed like he's got sand pouring down his face. So obviously you had to have had like a 3D model of his face remade yeah. and matched in so that you can have that new particle sim of sand falling down. Yeah. The lightning flashes going on is actually hitting him there. That couldn't have been in the original movie. Yeah. And we have the 3D model of him. And like you said, we had to have that for the sand simulation anyway. So you can also use that as a way to manipulate the lighting as well. So that chart there, is that a full 3D model or is that footage of him that you guys are kind of then manipulating it's from Spider-Man 2? Both. Or Spider-Man 3. Yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah. Where's the box, Peter? With No Way Home, we had an opportunity to see what's effectively a full CG character realized at a different era with VFX technology. So we had Sandman back with Spider-Man 3, and it was a pretty big deal to have grain simulations and that many particles on screen at the same time. And then you guys revisited Sandman here. How did the technology change between those two films with almost a decade and a half, if not two decades between them? Certainly technology has changed in a big way. More effective simulations, the power to compute more. It certainly improved in 10 years dramatically. Ultimately, in some of these big simulations, they were like 300 million particles or something like that. It's like really crazy. That's a lot. But they're big simulations, and Chris Wagner of Imageworks would remind me of that all the time. <laughs> like, if I, if I had notes, it's like, okay, just reminding you that <laughs> these are very big sim simulations. But I feel like that's also very reasonable. It's like you have like this whole sequence took hours if not days and so many gigabytes or terabytes to simulate all this stuff and then it's like well i wanted this one little thing in this one corner here to be different but in order to make that change you have to redo it all. Yeah. That's how simulations work. Yeah. You use what you have. So in that sense, nothing has changed in 10 years. <laughs> like, what really has changed is the ability to iterate more. But because, yes, you can iterate more, but you're iterating with more. So it, you're always pushing that technology to its breaking point. Gotcha. <laughs> so as technology gets better, you're just turning up the number of particles and it still takes the same amount of time exactly. to render. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's really funny. If you think Spider-Man shooting web out of his wrist naturally is the way it should be, Subscribe. If you think shooting it with machines that Tony Stark made for him is the way it should be, hit the notification bell. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Brandy O'Daniel segment courtesy of today's sponsor Raycon. Now if you're already looking to click away, let me tell you something. This show would not be possible but for the sponsors. And also of course you, the beloved viewer, and you know, of course us, the content creator. But you know, look, it's like a trifecta, okay? It's a trinity of perfection. And we all hold hands and skip merrily through life's meadows to allow this show to be possible. Because if it wasn't for you, the viewer, and if it wasn't for the sponsor, and it wasn't for us, the content creator, this episode wouldn't exist at all. And that's just a shame, but you know what's even more of a shame? Paying full price 
for premium earbuds. Well, that's a thing of the past. Come on, guys, with Raycon, you can get premium audio for half the price as any other premium wireless earbud out there. Now, how do they do this? Well, it's actually quite simple. Raycon prioritizes the quality and the consumer first and foremost. You see, Raycon optimizes their earbuds with gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit. Now, we think that's very important because if you're going to wear these things every day, whether it's to the gym, to work, to the office, on your commute, wherever, however you need them, they're going to fit in your ears and not fall out. We've done extensive experimentation and these earbuds, they won't budge. And in addition to that, they have over eight hours of playtime with a 32 hour battery life. So these things are gonna go all day and have you sounding and feeling great. And if you don't believe me, well, guess what? Raycon earbuds have over 48,000 five-star reviews. And if that doesn't say quality, then I don't know what does anymore. So go on and hop, skip, and jump merrily with us over here at Corridor to buyraycon.com slash Corridor Crew to get 15% off your purchase. That's 15% off your purchase by going to buyraycon.com slash Corridor Crew. Once again, huge thanks to Raycon for sponsoring. And now let's get back to the episode. Thank you so much for watching. Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the couch with us. I enjoyed everything you've told us today. I learned a lot and had a lot of fascinating insights to these movies. So thank you, seriously. I really appreciate the time you spent for us. Thank you, it's great being here. <laughs> also, we have extended reacts on our website, quarterdigital.com, where it's a little less cut down. You get to hear a bit more of Kelly and our take on things, quarterdigital.com. And uh, we'll see you guys either tomorrow for our Sunday video or next Saturday if for some reason you don't watch the Sunday videos. <laughs> All right, see you then.